Good evening to our regular uh, audience. It's nice to see you back again. And welcome to any new people that we may have this week. Uh, my name is Alan Friedman. I'm Vice President of the Australian Jewish Association, and I will be your MC again for this evening. Uh, also visible on, on your screens are David Adler, President of the AJA, and Michael Bird, who is also involved with the AJA and my former co-host for Nothing Left. So good evening to you as well, and as well as uh, as well to our guest for, the, for, for tonight, Matthew Hausman, who we will introduce in a moment. As usual with our sessions, we'll speak with Matthew for about 30 minutes, after which we'll open up the discussion for some Q&A. So uh, have some questions ready, and I can see there's already one, one hand up. So uh, Ron, you're first up. Um, if you want to ask a question, please indicate this to us by clicking on the participants icon and then on the raise hand icon or, or a green tick uh, if you don't have the raise hand one, and that way we get to see that you want to ask a question. The chat function is available uh, as usual, so feel free to utilise it. And of course, everybody's been muted for this part of the session, but we will be allowing people to unmute, the, unmute themselves uh, once we get to question time. Okay, Michael, over to you. Thanks, uh, Alan. Uh, our guest tonight is Matthew Hausman, who is a trial lawyer and writer from Connecticut and is a prolific commentator on Israel, Middle East and American Jewish politics. His work has appeared in numerous publications and websites, including American Thinker, Arutz Sheva, Israel National News, Front Page Magazine, Israel Pundit and the New English Review. He is also a frequent radio guest and public speaker in the U.S., and Canada. And Alan and I have had the pleasure of Matthew's company quite a few times on our radio program, Nothing Left. With the US elections coming up next week, we wanted to ask him for his thoughts on the election campaign so far, why American Jews are so divided, and why Jews would even consider voting for Biden, notwithstanding President Trump has proved to be a true friend of Israel and the Jewish people. Uh, and uh, I must say, uh, we, we especially want to thank him for joining us now, uh, because the time is now five o'clock in the morning in Connecticut, on um, the east coast of America. Uh, Matthew, welcome to Australia and the Australian Jewish Association. Um, it's great to have you with us. It's nice to be here. Thank you. Um, now, firstly, what is your assessment of the respective campaigns to date? How did you read the polls? And what do you think the outcome will be? Well, I'll say compared to 2016, it's difficult to read the polls. The polls have Biden ahead. Depending on who you read, uh, it uh, is almost double digits. But of course, a week before the election in 2016, Hillary was up by 16 points. Uh, in some of the battleground states, some polls have uh, Biden ahead. Uh, some polls have them neck and neck. And there are some polls that have uh, um, uh, Trump ahead in, in certain key states. Um, it's hard to tell uh, for me because I've been reading polls about uh, the president, obviously, since before uh, his inauguration in January of 2017, and there are a number of things going on. And I'm not a conspiracy theorist. I don't believe in uh, uh, those kinds of theories, but there are certain trends that you could track. Uh, there are a number of polls that I would call suppression polls, especially when it comes to elections. Uh, if you're going to take a look at, for example, uh, um, uh, Time Newsweek poll, um, those polls typically um, are polling um, registered Democrats as opposed to likely voters. And those polls come out fast and furious before the election because my feeling and the feeling of a lot of media analysts not on the right or the left, by the way, but people who look at it objectively, is many of those polls come out to suppress uh, um, uh, votes that uh, would come out in support uh, of uh, the subject of the poll, in this case, uh, President Trump. Uh, there are some organizations that are inherently, uh, I think, more objective and more re reliable. Quinnipiac University here in Connecticut uh, has a nationally recognized polling organization. Uh, I would tend to give more credence to a Wall Street Journal Fox poll uh, than uh, I would to uh, Newsweek or, or CNN or, or uh, any of the mainstream uh, media outlets. The problem is that even those uh, don't necessarily reflect who's going to uh, come out and for whom. 
uh, there was a poll or a survey rather done about two months ago now uh, that in which uh, 10 to 12 percent of the independent voters polled said they didn't know who they were voting for president. Everybody's trying to extrapolate. Last time when that happened, that usually meant they were voting for President Trump. Um, but again, you can't necessarily take um, the the uh, results of the polls prior to the 2016 election as gospel for what's happening today. So the point is, I think it's a huge unknown. Um, do I think Biden can win next week? I do. Uh, do I think Trump could win? I, I do as well. Uh, because again, uh, Trump came out of left field in 2016 and he ran a very smart campaign. They were focusing, I, I don't know if people in Australia or are uh, familiar with the electoral system here. Uh, the United States, despite popular belief, is not a democracy per se. It's a constitutional republic, but we do have democratic elections. Uh, in certain kinds of elections, it's direct vote. One, you know, one person votes and that vote is counted for that person. That happens on the local level, that happens on the state level, and it happens on the national level with uh, Congress, uh, uh, you know, people voting for senators, uh, House of Representatives, those kinds of things. With the president and the Constitution, you're actually voting for the electors who will then uh, 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 elect the president. Uh, and that system was set up, it was assailed in 2016 uh, by the Democrats because, of course, uh, Trump, it was a massive electoral uh, uh, landslide, not, not a, a popular vote landslide. Hillary got a plurality, not a majority, but she got a plurality because there were three or four uh, uh, candidates, depending on the state that you were in, because there were a couple of independents uh, who never go anywhere, by the way. Um, but so the way it works is you vote for the elector. And the reason for that is when the Constitution was written, there were 13 colonies that became 13 states with different populations. So uh, the founding fathers, when they wrote the Constitution, did not want a state with a small population to be shut out of the process, and they didn't want states with larger populations to be overrepresented. So it was devised as a way to assure fairness between the states. So uh, this is what President Trump's campaign focused on last time. They knew they were never going to win California and New York. And unless you win California and New York in a close election, you're not going to get a majority. So what they did is they focused on those electoral states that were in play, the swing states, so to speak, and they engineered a brilliant campaign uh, to bring it home. This time, in a lot of those swing states, the polls have them neck and neck or have Biden ahead. But then again, in 2016, the polls did as well. So it's very difficult to tell what's going to happen. But I think uh, the president has that same strategy, you know, give up on California, New York. They're never going to they're the bluest of the blue states. They're never going to go for you, but they're trying to focus on those swing states that are going to deliver the electorals and hopefully uh, deliver enough, you know, in a large enough quantity so that uh, they can take Biden again, uh, take the Democrats yeah. rather. Alan? Um, That's Matt, the, the long way of saying I'm not sure what's going to happen. <laughs> either of them winning and when you read the I'm, I'm not punking out here but it, it's very difficult uh to divine what's going to happen because you're relying on polls that uh are, are uh, polling different criteria they're polling you know registered voters as to likely voters but i will say uh something that has the democrats very concerned right now is obama came out to stump for Biden. Now, parenthetically, when Obama has come out to stump for anybody running for national office, they always lose. Uh, but, you know, they have like 50, 100 people showing up to these Obama events. And uh, Trump, when he has his rallies, he has, you know, 20, 30, 40,000 people show up. So what has Democrats who are looking at this objectively worried is he's generating that kind of buzz in states where it's essential for Republicans to come out and vote. So, you know, an honest Democratic pollster will tell you, we don't know what's gonna happen. So um, if their polls are correct, then Trump loses potentially in a landslide. If the independent polls are correct, it could be close. Uh, he might come out on the short end on the popular vote, but he could uh, pull those key electoral states together and engineer a victory. So. Yeah, it's, it's one of those things because we're dealing with Trump. And even in anonymous polls, people won't say that they're voting for him. He's very polarizing. 
uh, because of his style and everything else. So that was the thing with independent voters. They just don't want to say they're voting for him if they truly are. So mm -hmm. are they vote for him or are they really not voting for him this time? Nobody will know until election day. Yeah, Matthew, um, over the last few years, we've, we've seen politicians that drift to the left significantly haven't done particularly well. You know, we look at Jeremy Corbyn in England, uh, in, in our own Australian election, uh, our Labor Party drifted to the left and got trounced. I think in Israel we see the same thing. So Biden seems to have aligned himself quite strongly with the left. How do you see that? Do you see that as being a problem for him? It should be a problem, but, you know, in order for it to be a problem, you have to know it exists. If you watch CNN and get your news from CNN, you're never going to get that. If you read mm -hmm. the world, uh, excuse me, the New York Times or the Boston Globe or the Washington Post or the LA Times, you're not going to get that. If you watch MSNBC, you're certainly not going to get that. They're still, you know, trying to propagate this Russian nonsense that, that was baseless. Um, if you read Wall Street Journal or Fox uh, or another, another of, uh, um, a number of other uh, outlets, you might get that. That's the problem. You know, there are a lot of people uh, who watch particular news outlets out of habit. It's traditional for them. Like for some Jews, the only thing about being Jewish is bagels in the New York Times on uh, Sunday Sunday morning. Fair. But, um, you know, but, but, but that's the problem. And the interesting thing is um, the hope might be that there are mainstream liberals, I call them, represented by Alan Dershowitz, for example. Alan is very principled. Um, he's a civil libertarian. He's never wavered on that. But he's a Democrat in the sense of, let's say, the late 60s, early 1970s, when I was a kid getting in trouble in school, um, where, you know, the thing that separated a centrist Democrat uh, from a centrist Republican was a little line in the middle, but they agreed on a lot, and they certainly agreed on things like uh, uh, civil liberties. That doesn't happen anymore. But <clears throat> the, the thing is, is you find people, and I think you can... Uh, sort of intuit this from the numbers that watch various outlets. CNN's, it's been a while since I've looked at uh, surveys, but CNN's uh, viewers are 90 plus percent liberal to left leaning. MSNBC's, let's say they're left leaning to communists. Uh, <laughs> Fox, uh, which uh, suffered the slings and arrows of the Obama administration for eight years. Um, everybody gets it wrong sometimes, but that's an outlet where the editorial department does not direct the way the news is reported. It doesn't determine what's going to be covered and how it's going to be covered. So interestingly, uh, Fox's viewership last time I, I uh, uh, looked at any surveys was roughly 30% uh, conservative, 30% liberal, and 40% independents. Uh, so you find liberals, principled liberals like Alan Dershowitz, reading uh, or watching Fox or reading the Wall Street Journal because they really want to get the news. For international news about Israel, by the way, Fox gets it wrong sometimes as well. So very often I go to the Israeli uh, uh, papers for that directly, and then I see how it plays out. And for uh, uh, fun, sometimes I'll read some of the European newspapers who pillory Israel. But, you know, I write about this stuff. Media criticism is also something that I write about, so I have to see what they're writing in order to critique it. Um, so, yes, uh, I believe it should hurt him, and in some states it definitely will. You know, the interesting thing is the Democrats always try to be proactive, and by being proactive, they always take what's going on in their party, and then they impose it or they superimpose it on the other side. For example, they've been saying for years that the Republican Party has been hijacked by the right wing. Uh, that's nonsense. If the Republican Party were hijacked by the right wing, John McCain would not have been the candidate in 2008. Uh, Mitt Romney certainly would not have been the candidate in 2012. And by the way, Trump wouldn't have been the candidate in 2016 because, surprise, surprise, he's not a political conservative. He's very conservative about some things. He's actually not conservative about others. He believes, for example, in the government's power of eminent domain. And what that means is the government can condemn property to take for public use. They have to compensate you for that property, and the Constitution provides for it, but that's anathema to conservatives. But as a developer in a state like New York, uh, uh, Donald Trump believes in eminent domain. So there are some things that he does that are in line with conservatives. His, his remaking of the judiciary has been brilliant. 
uh, Amy Coney Barrett was uh, uh, um, uh, confirmed the other day. Uh, he had three Supreme Court picks during his uh, presidency, his first, her, his first four years. That's unprecedented. And um, he's appointed a lot of conservative and centrist judges to the district court bench, federal district court, the appellate court bench. Uh, so, um, and by the way, conservative justices are less likely statistically to be activists than liberal judges. So um, um, what we have is I think example after example about how the Republicans have not gone to the right uh, end of the fringe, but the Democratic Party certainly has. If you take a look at uh, all the major candidates for the Democratic nomination, Cory Booker, uh, Bernie Sanders, all of these people, take a look at who their campaign staffs included. They all included, you know, something that's near and dear to all of our hearts, Israel. They all included BDS uh, people, or if not now, when people, uh, or J-Streeters, um, every one of them. Every single one of them boycotted the APAC convention last year. Uh, when uh, Kamala Harris was asked to condemn the anti-Semitic statements of Ilhan Omar, she wouldn't do it. And in fact, she expressed concern for her safety and welfare, not the safety and welfare of the people against whom she incites. Um, if you take a look at the way the squad, as they call them, have taken control of the party, and these are you know, three or four junior Congress, uh, Congresswomen uh, who should have virtually no power, and yet they've been appointed to prestigious positions. Uh, Ilan Omar and Rashida Tlaib have, uh, of course, they're known for their anti-Semitism. What happens? They get uh, uh, prestigious committee appointments. Uh, Nancy Pelosi goes on national TV to say, well, what they're saying really isn't anti-Semitic. It's they don't understand the lunch. They're, they're running interference, and yet when uh, Congressman Steve King from Iowa or Idaho, one of the I states in Connecticut, uh, he repeatedly made uh, 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 statements that were racist, uh, supportive of white supremacism. So what did the Republicans finally do? They censured him, they took away his committee appointments, and the National Party campaigned for his opponent in the primary. So uh, King lost the primary, so he's not in the running uh, next Tuesday. That's what a, 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 an objectively, you know, non-extreme party does. The Democrats are covering for a, a leftist extremist left and right, and anti-Semitism, unfortunately, has become uh, uh, um, uh, part of the Democratic landscape. Uh, refuse to root it out. And I, I'll, is one example of this, I don't mean to be too long-winded, but uh, uh, this is something that's, I think, really part of this election. In 1993, I'm sure you've all heard of William F. Buckley, the late William F. Buckley. Uh, he was the editor of the National Review. He was a conservative icon for years. He wrote a bazillion books. Um, in the early 1990s, there were a couple of uh, people on the editorial staff of the um, National Review that used to pillory Israel. And when he actually read some of those editorials and analyzed them, he said, boy, these writers are taking classical anti-Semitic canards and ascribing them to the Jewish state. So he kicked them off the staff of the National Review. He wrote a feature-length article called In Search of Anti-Semitism that he expanded into a, a book that was very popular. Conservatives had their, uh, were, it, it Republicans, but not all conservatives are Republican and not all Republicans are conservative. They had uh, their come to God meeting, as it were, in the early 1990s. They condemned anti-Semitism. They acknowledged that it's part of the political landscape, part of the cultural landscape, uh, part of the religious landscape, and they did something about it. The Democrats and liberals have had multiple uh, um, uh, occasions to do the same thing. Most recently, in the last four years, with all the anti-Semitic statements of uh, people from the squad, and not just them, but establishment Democrats as well. Ted Lieu, for example, Congressman of California, who was questioning uh, uh, David Friedman during his confirmation process, you know, the ambassador to Israel, of whether he had dual loyalties. That's a classic canard, uh, straight out of the protocols of the elders of Zion. Was Ted Lieu condemned for this? Certainly not. He was applauded and uh, he, he was celebrated for it. But the Democrats have had multiple occasions to do the same thing that William F. Buckley did in 1993, and every single time they've punted. Mm. Matthew, yeah, Matthew. What was the question? No. <laughs> Matthew, uh, I know that you're not a psychiatrist. However, 
However, I want to try to understand the thinking behind American liberal, progressive, <clears throat> reformist uh, Jews, or whatever other shades of left they may be. Um, they they support the Islamic uh, the Islamist squad members and Biden's Democrat Party, but how can these Jews be serious in claiming to support Israel and Jewish human rights by backing? which must be considered one of the most anti-Semitic political parties in US history. How do you explain this? Well, I'll start explaining it with a little joke. What's the difference between uh, Donald Trump and your average uh, liberal democratic Jew? Trump has Jewish grandchildren. Uh, <laughs> well, what, what we see is, is a, a sociological phenomenon that's been generations in the making. Um, and you, to understand this, you really have to go back uh, to the immigrant experience and what happened in Europe. You know, there's this false sense that progressivism has always been kinder to Jews and gentler to Jews than despotism, you know, the monarchs uh, uh, from, from Europe, than the church. Uh, it's not true. I mean, uh, I've written about this. Uh, I think ad nauseum, but uh, I, I'm always surprised that people don't know. If you go back to the founding fathers of progressivism, read what Voltaire wrote about the Jews. Read what Diderot Holbach, the French utopians, wrote about the Jews. They all hated the Jews. They wanted the Jews to assimilate. Some of them advocated exterminating the Jews if they couldn't be induced to assimilate. In order to have your ticket to progressive society in Europe, you typically had to give up that which made you uh, uh, separate and apart. You had to uh, uh, you know, acculturate, um, you know, that was carried over that attitude, I think, during the Haskalah, the Enlightenment, where it sort of morphed into people rejecting uh, Jewish particularism, as, as they saw it, uh, rejecting religion and focusing simply on culture and trying to turn it into something else. Uh, the Wiesenschaft, uh, you know, the science of Judaism, um, that was, uh, I think, the, the, the grandfather of that, at least the ideological grandfather, was, was Moses Mendelssohn. And then you had many people involved, uh, 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 Gans, Edward Gans, for example, in Germany, was a leading um, uh, Wiesenschaft intellectual, by the way, ended up getting baptized to advance his uh, career as a legal professor. Um, you had, I think, this... Um, schizophrenia, I guess, cultural schizophrenia, where Jews, uh, sometimes they wanted to remain Jews, but they wanted to metamorphose the identity into something else. Um, and anyway, so this was all out of the cauldron of Europe. And people tend to think that progressivism is what freed the Jews in Europe, not realizing it wasn't progressivism. Napoleon is the one who tore down the ghetto walls. Napoleon was a monarchist, albeit not a hereditary monarchist, but, you know, he was imperious. I mean, that's, that, that's what he believed. He believed in Napoleon. Uh, he wasn't a, a French Democrat, if you will. Uh, cut to the United States when people start to come to this country. You're living on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. You're working in a sweatshop. You become involved in trade unions, which certainly had their place in the early 20th century. And they did a lot of good. But it was natural, I think, for a lot of people to... Um, uh, gravitate towards the party that became associated uh, with trade unionism. If you take a look at the leaders of the trade union movement in the United States, Samuel Gompers was head of, I think it was the Federation of Labor. He was a Jew from, from Eastern Europe. So uh, that's part of what uh, I think led Jews to liberalism in the Democratic Party in this country. Uh, you have to add to that the liberal ritual movements. Now, I'm not disparaging anybody you know, observance is a, a personal thing. Um, and I like Chabad's approach. They want everybody to be observant. But if you're not, they're not judging you and they're accepting you where you are because a little is better than nothing, right? So can't bring people along uh, um, uh, in terms of observance if you make them feel uh, 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 ineffectual or somehow less because of where they are. That's not how, how we should ever look at things. But what happened is we had the ritual movements, uh, the reform movement in particular, uh, starting in Wiesbaden in Germany in 1837, the Frankfurt on Main Conference, you know, they rejected Jewish law. 
they rejected the primacy of the Jewish people. If you take a look at the Pittsburgh platform from the 1880s in this country, uh, you know, why do they call synagogues temples? Okay, they said we reject uh, uh, Judaism as a, a people. We reject Jewish nationality. We have no expectation in or belief in Mashiach. New York is our Jerusalem. The synagogue is our temple. So when people use the word temple to refer to a shul, they're really, you know, uh, 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 carrying a political standard. They may not realize it. The American conservative movement, uh, capital C, Jewish conservative movement, ironically, is very liberal. Uh, the difference between reform and conservative these days is reform is honest about what they reject. Conservatives said they still live according to Jewish law and halacha, but the truth is they don't. They kind of make it up uh, as they go along. And you take a look at the statistics, uh, fewer than 19% of people who belong to the conservative movement keep kosher, observe any semblance of Shabbos. Uh, intermarriage rates are 73% in this country amongst the non-Orthodox. That's, that's intolerable. But what they have done is when they rejected uh, Yiddishkeit, they tried to, to focus on what they said were the universal values. They had to look for something to fill that void. In the early 20th century, later 20th century, they gravitated towards progressivism. And during the uh, Roosevelt administration, uh, Franklin Delano, Delano Roosevelt, they by and large became uh, New Dealers, uh, progressives. That became their observance. That became the religion of these people who were divorced from normative Judaism. Um, and this continued, and it's interesting because FDR was not a friend of the Jews. Uh, he was uh, uh, anti-Semitic. Uh, he refused to uh, lift immigration restrictions so the Jews escaping the Nazis could come here. And as a result, perhaps a million more died than would have. And why did he do this? According to a conversation he had with Rabbi Stephen Mayer Wise, the Jews were already overrepresented in the professions in this country. I mean, could you imagine a Republican saying something like that and not being pilloried in the press? But liberalism and progressivism became a religion for these people. You know, tikkun olam, you know, that's a phrase that, that uh, makes me ill because they have no understanding what it is. Tikkun olam, we call them tikkun olam Jews here. They believe in social uh, activism, they're social justice warriors. But for them, the term tikkun olam has become a repository for progressive political values. And the fact of the matter is they don't understand the concept. The concept really is tikkun olam doesn't mean saving the world. Uh, it's for the proper workings of society. And what does it traditionally refer to? It refers to those mitzvot, those uh, uh, observances that preserve community integrity, uh, divorce, uh, damages uh, law. Uh, it's not relevant today, but uh, the redemption of captives, for example. And if you know anything about Lurianic Kabbalah, it's about uh, uh, um, uh, assembling the sparks that were said to have dispersed at the creation of the universe to bring tikkun, to bring rectification. But it's always predicated on Jews acting like Jews, on knowing their responsibilities as Jews, on observing what they should. It has nothing to do with politics. And yet you have two major movements in this country that have uh, uh, sort of postured themselves around this tikkun olam uh, uh, idea, which is a bastardization of the concept their rabbis don't understand. And frankly, you know, reform rabbis don't study halacha except in the most cursory fashion. And the fact is conservative rabbis don't either, but they have no problem from the bima stumping for Obama. The rabbis for Obama were all conservative reform and reconstructionist rabbis. So they get this, uh, you have generations of people now, five, seven, ten generations, who have no connection to observance of any kind. Their knowledge of Jewish history is abysmal. Their knowledge of Israel, you know, for these people, Israel, the history begins in 1948. They have no idea about the kingdom of Judea. They have no idea about the second Jewish commonwealth of the war with the, with the Romans. They don't know any of this, and they're not encouraged to know any of this. They're fed politics from the Bema uh, by rabbis who also similarly don't have backgrounds. Uh, look, I'm not begrudging anybody a professional title, but from my personal background, you know, I come from a traditional background. I can't subscribe to a rabbi who knows less Yiddish kite than I do. You know, and believe me, I'm no rabbi. I'm, I'm, not the, I'm not the sharpest knife in the drawer. But these are the people who call themselves rabbis. They become community leaders. 
and they're lecturing their congregants in politics. And to be a good Jew in the reform and conservative movement means to support the Democratic Party, means to vote for Obama, the most anti-Israel president we've ever had. And perhaps uh, I think we saw anti-Semitism at an all-time high during his administration. There were over 7,000 uh, hate crimes uh, 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 that were identified during his administration. For all these people who accused Trump of uh, uh, anti-Semitism, where were they during the Obama administration? And by the way, the anti-Semitism uh, uh, rate has risen in this country. Uh, it's continued to rise, but where is it coming from? If you take a look at statistics, it's coming predominantly from the left. It's coming predominantly from the minority communities and uh, the American Muslim community. Not, not that all those people are anti-Semitic, but that's where most of this is coming from. Take a look at the old Occupy Wall Street, uh, Wall Street websites. Take a look at all the anti-Semitic conspiracy theories that appeared there. Uh, during Occupy Wall Street, there was a sub-movement to Occupy APAC. They tried to occupy various Israeli uh, embassies. Uh, what does that have to do with, with uh, uh, income inequality? Um, you know, take a look at uh, uh, what's happening in the current protest movement today. A lot of anti-Semitism, a lot of conspiracy theories, but Jews don't want to see it because they've been raised to think that liberalism is qua a Jewish uh, uh, quality. When, you know, I personally don't belong to a political party. I register to vote and I always vote, but I'm a registered unaffiliated. Why? My personal belief is that especially one of the reasons because if I'm going to write and critique people, it's better for me not to be affiliated with one party or the other, uh, give the appearance of objectivity, at least, uh, you know, in, in terms of uh, partisan politics. But you shouldn't be, a, if you choose to be a Democrat or you choose to be a Republican, it is not because you're a Jew. Are certain liberal principles consistent with Jewish values? Yes, some of them are. Are a lot of conservative values consistent uh, with Yiddishkeit, they certainly are. So you can't say I'm a, a Democrat because I'm a Jew. That's nonsense. In fact, these days, because if you have a party that's running interference through anti-Semitism, it's the Democratic Party. <clears throat> so if anything, uh, if you uh, think Ma about Ma the as I do, that's what you should be focusing on. Yeah, yeah Matthew, I'm going to interrupt you. Sorry, because sure. we, want, we want to get to the audience, Alan. <laughs> Do you want to yeah, uh, okay. uh, we'll, open we'll it up to the audience? Questions. There's a lot of questions out there, yeah. Yeah, okay. So um, I've got uh, Terry and Leon with their hands up. Ron, you had your hand up at the beginning. I'm not sure if you still have a question. Sometimes people put their hands up and then the question gets answered during the course of the discussion. So uh, I'll, I'll go to Terry and uh, Leon and then Dennis. And Ron, if, you're, if, you're, if your question is still current, uh, let me know. So, Terry, uh, please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thanks for that. It's very, very informative, especially on uh, the, uh, uh, the views of liberal Jews and why they possibly support the Democrat Party. Um, one thing that strikes me about um, Trump, which uh, I find unusual amongst most Western leaders now, is that I believe that he genuinely sees his role as to represent the American people who, who elect him. I, I don't see him as a guy that goes off trying to uh, impress the UN and have big dinners with uh, international leaders and basically forgetting the people who elected him and, um, uh, and representing themselves or, or their, their, their own particular uh, strands of political uh, idealism. Uh, is that something that um, it, 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 it is picked up in the American electorate? Is it something that um, is, is recognized in terms of the, uh, the difference between Biden, who is basically old school, and uh, Trump, who as I believe that he's truly representative? Uh, yeah, it is. Uh, whether it's a positive or a negative depends who you ask. Uh, on the Democratic side, they'll say that's dangerous populism. <clears throat> on uh, the Republican side, it's refreshing. Uh, you have a lot of people, even on the Republican side, who felt uncomfortable not because they believe in just maintaining the structure of the swamp, as uh, Trump and his base call it, um, but populism traditionally has made people uncomfortable. Uh, the United States has had uh, uh, an interesting relationship to populism. I don't know if anybody's ever heard of Huey Long. He was a fair 
totalitarian governor of Louisiana. He basically ruled by fiat. Everybody's heard of McCarthy and Joe McCarthy, McCarthyism. Uh, McCarthy was a Republican, but the truth of the matter is McCarthy had real no political dogma or doctrine that he subscribed to. If in order to get involved in politics uh, in Wisconsin, he had to be a Democrat, he would have been a Democrat, but he was a populist. The difference with Donald Trump, I think, is he's actually taken um, this uh, 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 populist impulse, done something with it. He has, if you take a look at dispassionately at what he did during for his first administration, he brought unemployment among minorities to the uh, lowest point ever. Um, he brought home ownership to communities to its highest level ever. Um, this, I think, is uh, a, a true um, reflection, I think, of his brand of populism. The problem, the problem is people take, take a look at populism and see that historically uh, it's been uh, pushed by people that end up having a very total, fairly totalitarian or fascist mentality. I'm not talking about fascist, you know, the Italian fascists or Nazis, but I'm talking about that imperious impulse and that uh, idea that uh, uh, the state is above all else, which, by the way, you know, you can also uh, uh, take from socialism and communism. But people have, uh, again, a very ticklish feeling about it. But uh, Donald Trump did not go the way of Huey Long. He certainly didn't go the way of Joe McCarthy. Uh, he's continued to get out there and do things. And if we didn't have these shutdowns because of COVID, I don't think we'd be having today. If the economy were uh, not uh, crippled by all the shutdowns, people would not be uh, um, uh, saying the things they're saying. But it's a form of populism. But he's, I think, shown that populism doesn't have to be evil. It can actually be made to work. Okay, thanks, Matthew. Now, Leon, um, uh, we realize you don't have a camera, so please ask your question, and then we'll go to Dennis. Good evening, Dr. Houseman. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, Mr. Houseman, but thanks for the promotion. Oh, sorry, yes. Mr. Houseman, <laughs> yes. Okay. Um, look, um, Matthew was better, so that's fine. All right, Matthew, with your permission, I'll go ahead, Matthew. Um, we know that um, Barack Obama was a member of the anti-Semitic Jeremiah Wright, the anti-Semitic preacher's congregation for about yep. 20 years, I believe. 23. Um, yes. Now, he... Um, he remained in that uh, congregation uh, knowing what Jeremiah Wright's views on Jews are. Is there any evidence about Obama's attitude to Jews in general? Any signs, any evidence of any sort of antipathy to the Jewish people? He was opportunistic or he, he, he used bad judgment in his treatment of Israel, obviously, Iran, clutching the Muslim Brotherhood to his breast and so forth. But is there any hint that he may have harbored anti-Semitic sentiments? Well, you, you, again, you're right, uh, Leon, he plays it close to the vest, but if you take a look, how do we determine whether somebody's anti-Semitic today uh, if they don't, you know, uh, leave a footprint on the internet or write anti-Semitic articles? I think we go to the associations. It wasn't just Jeremiah Wright's church. When Obama was a community organizer in Chicago, he was close to the Nation of Islam and Louis Farrakhan. If you take a look at some of his associations, Rashid Khalidi, the late Edward Said, uh, Bill Ayers, uh, who was no friend of the Jews, <coughs> excuse me, and take a look at <coughs> some of the anti-Semitic ideologues and politicians that he's embraced, uh, you could, I suppose, uh, infer from that a comfort level with those people. If you take a look at the way he treated Israel, it wasn't just unfortunate and it wasn't ignorant. You know, he was in effect, you take a look at his, the theory of linkage that he subscribed to, which says that Israel's uh, um, conflict with the Palestinians, I'll put that in quotes, um, is responsible for all unrest in the Middle East. That's nonsense, it's, it's ridiculous. You know, you have warring ethnic groups, religious groups, national factions that have been killing each other for 2,000 years and more so since the rise of Islam. Um, the theory of linkage is sort of like an inversion of the classical anti-Semitic global conspiracy theory. 
It puts Israel at the center of all controversy in the Mideast when, just ask yourself logically, what does Israel have to do with the civil war in Yemen that's being, you know, uh, uh, stimulated and kept going by the Iranians? What does it have to do with Bashir al-Assad's uh, uh, um, use of poison gas against his own citizens? What does it have to do with the Shiite versus Sunni controversy along the Gulf? Absolutely nothing. Um, when you see the way he treated Netanyahu, look, you can like a world leader or hate a world leader, but you don't uh, require him and his retinue uh, to come into a side door in the White House. You don't purposely uh, prepare a dinner of non-kosher food. You know, look, a lot of them probably don't eat kosher, but that was a knowing slap in the face. And you don't refuse to meet with him and then a week later have Mahmoud Abbas who in his old name, Abu uh, Ma Mazen or Mazen, uh, was supposedly the money man uh, uh, or one of the money men involved in the Munich massacre. Um, you don't do this. So if you take a look at his associations, you take a look at the way Israel was treated as a pariah. You know, people say that the new anti-Zionism is the new anti-Semitism, and I think that's entirely correct. If you take a look at what he said and what he did with respect to Israel, he delegitimized Israel constantly. Uh, when he talked about Israel in his famous Cairo speech in 2009, he talked about Israel's uh, uh, existence uh, merely being a result of the Holocaust. There was no uh, uh, acknowledgement of Jewish indigeneity. There was no acknowledgement that the population, the most extant population that's been there the longest is Jews, they're not Arabs, they're not Turks, they're not Greeks. You know, uh, they're forgetting about the holy cities, which have had people immigrating, coming in, and, and natives. You had, for example, the town of Pekain, which was never depopulated during the war with Rome. It always had a Jewish population. There was no acknowledgement of any of that. Um, and uh, uh, I, I think, again, to ignore Jewish history or deny Jewish history, I think that's a form of anti-Semitism. Uh, now, parenthetically, let's just say, look, there were Jews who were anti-Zionist as well. But, and with the left, I think it's an expression of self-hatred. With the Natura Carta, I do not endorse what they do by any stretch. And I think they're horrible for meeting with, you know, representatives of Iran. However, it doesn't come from a place of denying Jewish peoplehood, of denying Jewish continuity. It's because they believe that a secular political state, well, quasi-secular political state, interferes with people's belief in Mashiach. Okay, I disagree with that, but it doesn't come from the same place that anti-Zionism comes from from the left. So I think taken in their totality, um, I, I don't think uh, you can come to any other conclusion. And if you take a look at what did he do before he left office in 2016, uh, he engineered... Uh, I forget the resolution number, the UN resolution that uh, denied uh, Jewish presence in Jerusalem, in Judea and Samaria, which, by the way, the Wiesenthal Center, which is neither right nor left, called the most significant act of international anti-Semitism, I'm paraphrasing, of 2016. And by the way, Joe Biden was apparently reportedly responsible for soliciting the Ukraine's uh, um, uh, abstention uh, from that vote uh, to assure that it would pass and the U.S. wouldn't veto it. So I can't think that somebody who's philo-Semitic would have ever been involved in something like that. I can't think that somebody who's philo-Semitic would have pursued an Iranian deal that puts Israel at direct risk and freed up almost $200 billion that they gave back to the Iranians, which by and large financed uh, terrorism around the region and its, its uh, actions against Israel. So I think taken in their totality, do I believe that that uh, that doesn't make a good case for him? Let's put it that way. Do I know it's in his heart? I may not. But again, yeah, I go by associations and I go by record. Yeah. Okay. Thanks, Dennis. Your turn. Please unmute yourself, and then we've got Helen. I'm trying to unmute. <clears throat> unmute. Yeah. No, you, we can hear you. Oh, no, we can't. Hang on. You need to unmute yourself, Dennis. You. Okay, now you are. I'm right. Good, good morning, Matthew. Uh, morning. I want to deal with uh, a couple of hypotheticals now. The first sure. hypothetical is if Biden wins the presidency, what do you foresee 
as the attitude to Israel and to Iran and to Turkey and to the Palestinians. And secondly, assuming that it is proven that he is mentally unfit at some point early in the term, Kamala Harris, who is further left than Biden, might assume the presidency, uh, what would the implications for Israel be? I'm really concerned about the presidency and the impact on Israel. Uh, we have uh, every reason to be concerned. Let's take a look at Biden's personal record on Israel. In 1982, when he was a junior senator, he threatened Menachem Begin from the floor of the Senate. And by the way, Begin mops the floor with him. Um, he blames Israeli policy for generating terrorism against Jews. Uh, while consistently ignoring Palestinian incitement and anti-Semitism. Uh, he falsely identified, I don't know if you remember this, in 2010, we had the Ramat Shlomo crisis uh, in, in Israel, Jerusalem. Uh, Ramat Shlomo was a Jewish neighborhood. It's always been a Jewish neighborhood. Excuse religion, me. When there was a, a building, when the permits granted, um, they called it the expansion of a settlement. Uh, and he identified the Ramat Shlomo crisis as disputed territory. It's never been disputed territory. Uh, he criticized Trump's relocation of the American embassy to Jerusalem in accordance with a law that was passed in 1996 that Biden himself voted for. Um, he was involved reportedly in Obama's uh, scheme with uh, the United Nations and John Kerry to pass that anti-Israel and, dare I say, anti-Semitic resolution in 2016. Uh, he was the vice president of the most virulently anti-Israel administration since Jimmy Carter. Um, he supported the Iran deal, and he's also made noise, and Kamala Harris has made uh, no uh, uh, dispute of the fact that she would intend in a Harris-Biden administration, she misspoke, uh, of reinstituting the deal. Um, I'd be very concerned for Israel, especially with the noise that Biden's made on the campaign trail that he's very troubled by Israel. Now, what would happen? Let's take a look at what Trump has done with the Abraham Accords, as they call them. You know, the truth of the matter is Bahrain, the UAE, and Sudan, Sudan uh, aren't really existential threats to Israel. They're anti-Israel for sure. Uh, terrorist funds have funneled through, I think, all of those states. But the fact of the matter is they're not a frontline belligerent. None of them are frontline belligerents, never have been. But here's what Trump has done. He's changed the paradigm. When you know they announced this uh, uh, plan with the Israelis, frankly, I thought there were very naive aspects to it, and I, I still do. Um, it still calls for a Palestinian state. And if you know your history, you know, San Remo and the, and the mandate and the Transjordan Memorandum of 1923, the only um, <clears throat> division of lands that were anticipated was the creation of an Arab state and a Jewish state. Well, the Arab state was created with the creation of Jordan on almost 80% of the Jewish homeland. There was no imperative to create two Arab states and one Jewish state. Leaving that aside, uh, I think that is uh, a weakness in his plan for Israel. However, it did change the paradigm, and he continued to change the paradigm because people don't realize the significance. This theory of linkage that uh, uh, liberals and progressives in the Obama administration were married to, uh, he turned that on its head. Uh, he created uh, or he fostered or instilled the, uh, um, I think, will to create relationships with countries who, you know, after the Khartoum conference, uh, after the 67 war, they said no recognition, no negotiation, and no peace. So what he's done is he's shown that that paradigm of a quote-unquote two-state solution and that paradigm that is always informed by the theory of linkage is more abundant at this point. He's created or he's fostered agreements with countries that never had relationships with Israel and had no incentive to have relationships with Israel, and yet we have three peace uh, 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 accords, which, by the way, are different than the one with Egypt. People don't realize Egypt closed down. The Camp David Accords closed down a hot front for sure. Uh, I don't think Begin was under any illusions that it was a permanent peace. And in fact, it doesn't call for normalization between Egypt and Israel. That never happened. Uh, the, the peace treaty with Jordan, as it is, really doesn't mean anything. You've got a, 
uh, a sovereign there who's fairly uh, anti-Israel, and, and I personally think he doesn't like Jews all that much. But you have three um, accords now that the partners to a treat each other as partners. That's never happened before. Uh, I think if we have a Biden administration, those endeavors are going to cease. Um, they're going to go back, I think, to business as usual and try to force a Palestinian state on Israel and Judea and Samaria with uh, uh, a capital in Jerusalem, which was never the capital of any sovereign state except for a Jewish one ever. Uh, I think that's what we're going to go back to if that happens, and I fear for Israel if it does. Yeah, okay, thanks. Helen, your turn. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. I uh, think yeah, I am unmuted, yeah. Uh, Matthew, as a Jew living in Melbourne, I pray for Trump to win the next election. Mm -hmm. However, if I were living in the United States and... Some of my friends, Jewish friends, do live in the United States. The concern is greatly with the virus and Trump's debonair, apparently debonair attitude towards its control. So I have the dilemma, a moral dilemma, that I would, living outside the United States, I would vote for him. I'm not mm -hmm. so sure that if I were living inside the United States, mm -hmm. as an ardent Zionist, I would vote for him. <laughs> Well, so is the question, uh, should how, the question the is, virus be up? My question is, how much do you think this is affecting American Jews? That dilemma. I think on the surface it's affecting them a lot, but for most American Jews it's not a dilemma because they're going to vote Democrat anyway. If you take a look at the response to the virus, look, Trump speaks his mind. Uh, I'm very uncomfortable with the way he tweets and some of the things that he says, but I've been able to separate that from what he has actually done. Uh, as uh, one of my colleagues said, I approve of 80% of what he does and I disapprove of 90% of what he tweets. But if you take a look at what really has happened with this virus and you take a look at the numbers, uh, per capita the infection rate is less than Korea. Um, did 200,000 people die? The truth is they really don't know because the first few months of the virus, people were being diagnosed without blood tests. They really don't know. If you take a look at morbidity and mortality statistics, morbidity, uh, mortality rather, is, is less than, than the flu under the age of 78. And if you factor in the elderly, two months ago it was about 0.05%. Now that infections have gone up to here, but deaths haven't, I would dare say that the uh, mort mortality rate is lower. What happened when, I think people are, are confusing some of, uh, his hyperbolic rhetoric with what actually happened. What happened when it was identified? He closed the borders, which, by the way, Joe Biden and the Democrats said was xenophobia. You know, they, they he was condemned for that. Um, he assembled a, a COVID response team, and I thought it was silly to have updates every day on the news because it goes well for a week, and then people find fault with it. But if you take a look at what's actually happened, we're now, uh, we have a virus that's in final human tests, uh, excuse me, a virus, uh, a vaccine uh, for the virus. Um, I don't think uh, a vaccine, a uh, potential vaccine, has ever been brought to this stage in a matter of months. It doesn't happen that fast. And I used to be a science, health, and medical writer, so I'm saying I don't see that he's done anything to make it worse. I don't think he has at all. And uh, if you take a look at some of the evidence out there, again, we're on the verge of a vaccine, which, you know, normally takes years uh, uh, to, to perfect or, or get safe enough for human trials. So I wish he wouldn't say some of the things that he says, because I think it detracts from what the reality is. But do I think the Democrats would have uh, uh, gotten better results? I think the Democrats would have kept the borders open and they would have kept people coming from hot areas. That's what I think. And if you take a look at their statements, that's exactly what they called for. Mm. Okay, Ron, I think we might have to make you the last question, so please unmute yourself and ask your question. Ron? I just want to know about the, um, the possibility. I understand because of... Um, because you're, a bit, you're a bit soft, Ron. Maybe try and get a little bit closer to, uh, to your computer or phone. The, the constitutional issues... Um, they can't easily adopt the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism in America. Um, is it possible to use it as a working definition? 
I've, I heard the question and uh, I also know the answer. Um, but Matthew, it was about the IHRA definition of anti-Semitism and uh, the adoption of that in the US. Um, what do I think of it? Uh, has it has it has it been done? I mean, at the it was it was done in an executive order uh, mm -hmm. applicable to uh, federally funded colleges, I think. Sure. Uh, it, and what it does, among other things, it includes uh, essentially anti-Zionism or the denial of uh, um, <clears throat> uh, Jewish history in Israel. The denial of Israel's legitimacy is recognized as a form of anti-Semitism. So, is the question? Has his signing the executive order had uh, an effect on college campuses? The question is, um, I understand because of constitutional issues regarding free speech, that um, this is a problem to adopt this uh, IHRA definition. Oh, I, I see. No, no. It, it, um, but because uh, if you have it as a working definition, then you've got people like Peter Beinart and uh, certainly some rabbis um, that would fall foul of this definition. Well, yeah, it's interesting that Bayer and those rabbis have no problem with speech restrictions on campus that, uh, that, that uh, um, make hate speech illegal. Here's the thing. The definition, does, the, definition the executive order signed uh, by the president doesn't require anybody to think anything. It creates a valid definition. Um, does, if somebody engages in hate, uh, the various administrations have tied funding to incitement that goes on on campus. We're always walking a fine line, by the way, when you're talking about uh, um, criminalizing uh, speech. That's not what the executive order does. Uh, the difference between that and hate speech legislation, for example, is hate speech laws make actual speech illegal, and that is a constitutional problem. Uh, I don't think the president's signing of the executive order, it doesn't create a crime. It doesn't make uh, speech punishable criminally. I think that's where you start to run afoul uh, of the Constitution. By the way, uh, as an attorney, and I, I've tried a number of constitutional cases, I have a problem uh, with hate speech uh, laws. And the reason always is, is that, first of all, the Constitution, uh, uh, First Amendment, uh, says the government shall not impinge, you know, one's right to speech and, you know, sh shouldn't engage in prior uh, restraint of the press. That's not unfettered, by the way. During wartime and national emergency, government does have uh, uh, um, the ability to curtail certain kinds of speech. But the executive order doesn't rise to that level. Uh, it's not a law that criminalizes anything. If it did, uh, frankly, I would say you should do an executive order recognizing uh, a definition of anti-Semitism that can be applied, but you can't make it criminal for the same reason. You can't say it's illegal for somebody to uh, uh, um, announce their hate for someone because they have red hair, green eyes. You know, it's perfectly acceptable to say you hate somebody for any reason or no reason at all. Um, I'm not defending people's hatreds, but unfortunately when you have hate speech legislation, ultimately, uh, government becomes the arbiter of what's hate speech. And we know from the fairness doctrine of the 1970s, it becomes very political. And you find people, if the Democrats can control Congress, they're going to divine it politically. And by the same token, if Republicans control it, they're less likely to because conservatives don't believe in censorship because it requires an extension of government. But you find people on the right extreme, those aren't true conservatives, those are extremists. Um, so I can see where people would be uncomfortable with an executive order uh, uh, concerning anti-Semitism, but those people who are uncomfortable with it should have been more uncomfortable when the Obama administration was cutting funding to schools for engaging in what progressives call uh, hate speech, but which in fact could be something as simple as uh, expressing support for the Jewish state. That is considered microaggression on many college campuses, yet anti-Semitism is not. So do the math. Yeah. Okay. Look, uh, we're, we're going to have, have to wrap it up. Um, and I want to thank Matthew for joining us uh, today. It's been fabulous. Just before I hand over to David. Thank you. Uh, My uh, pleasure. Okay. Um, just before I hand over to David, um, uh, I want to ask you for a one word tip, Matthew. And 
and your answer will either make you a rooster or a feather duster. Um, who do you think is going to win? Uh, and, and I'm not. I honestly don't know. This is the first time that I really can't tell you uh, if if it's based on record. Again, if not for the economic shutdown, I don't think we'd be having this discussion. Um, I honestly don't know. I could see Biden winning. Uh, and somebody, I saw a message pop up. Uh, I don't know if it was doctor, uh, uh, thought it was a doctor saying something about uh, uh, having a present and cognitive decline. That scares me. It scares me a lot. Uh, you don't have to be a Republican or a Democrat to be scared by that prospect. I honestly can't, and I'm not being cute. I'm not trying to hedge myself. I really don't know. Um, no. I, I just, this is the first time I have no sense. Okay, all right. In 2008, I kind of knew Obama was going to win, and I was depressed before the election. because, And I didn't like McCain, by the way, but I thought based on his record concerning Israel and his his association with people that I think we can agree are not philo-Semitic, uh, but, but I could read the tea leaves. This, this, this time I can't, and one of the reasons is because the polls and surveys have been so unflattering and very often intentionally so. So I'm not sure. Mm. Okay. All right, I'll hand back to David to, uh, to make his usual announcements, and then we'll okay, say well, uh, goodbye to everybody. Okay, well, firstly, Matthew, thank you very much again for uh, rising at such an early hour over there uh, to join us and uh, sharing your thoughts. It was a great, great session. Um, so just, just wrapping up finally, uh, as usual, we call upon everyone to support AJA uh, if you're not yet uh, following us on Facebook, uh, please do so. Uh, it's important that you get onto our email list and anyone here who has not yet uh, put themselves on our email list, just send um, a short email to office at jewishassociation.org.au and um, we'll put you on so you're advised of future events and news. Uh, and of course, uh, if you're not yet a member, and if you can contribute to the association via the website, that's more than welcome. Now, next week's a bit unusual. We, we haven't got a, a regular event because next week is um, CPAC in Australia, the Conservative Political Action Committee. And for the first time uh, in this country, a Jewish representative has been invited as a featured speaker. So um, unfortunately, our Melbourne team can't join, but our Sydney team will be there. And uh, I've been invited to address uh, CPAC Australia. Uh, and we will try to live stream if it's technically possible and if it's allowable from CPAC a bit during the day and in the evening. But particularly this coming week, check your emails uh, for details as to what's happening uh, and how to do that. And finally, because uh, the Victorian restrictions have not been relaxed, uh, we do have a couple of spare tickets. So if you're in Sydney and you're interested in joining the AJA table, uh, send an email to office at jewishassociation.org.au. They are premium tickets. Um, there is a cost associated with it to attend the conference all day and into the evening there's a US election function where we will receive uh, uh, a feed and expert commentary on the, uh, on the US election. So a lot of uh, that theme that we've been discussing tonight you will find at the CPAC conference Wednesday next week. That's all. Thanks. Okay. Thank you, Matthew. Thanks, Michael. Thanks for having me. Okay. It's okay. nice uh, seeing Until some of you face to face for the first time. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. It's been wonderful having you with us, Matthew, and we'll, uh, we'll certainly have you back again. So, from, from me, it's good night to you all, and we'll see you all in a couple of weeks' time. Good night. Good night to everyone. Thank you.